With the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, the Royal Navy established itself as a fleet with reach and strength. And now during the 17th and 18th centuries, her shipbuilding expertise and revolutionary strategies would make her ships an impenetrable force on the oceans of the world. Known as wooden walls, these formidable vessels had no equal in strategy and firepower and redefined the way battles were fought and won. But the French, our long-time adversary, revealed weaknesses in her tactics that threatened to destroy Britain's seemingly endless success as ruler of the seas. Eventually, it would take a one-armed commander and a revolutionary plan of attack to reinvigorate her wooden walls. But the Royal Navy soon found that her fate, as well as an entire nation's, might hinge on a single shot. In October of 1805, Admiral Horatio Nelson leads his fleet aboard HMS Victory, heading to sea in what will culminate in the most decisive encounter in the history of the Royal Navy, the Battle of Trafalgar. It will also signal a decisive change in the way the British fight at sea, a change from a plan of attack that had helped shape the Royal Navy into one of the most renowned military forces in the world. It was a tactical system that was conceived two centuries earlier. At the beginning of the 17th century, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the new Stuart kings initially took little interest in their navy. But by 1640, Charles I had sustained a massive expansion program on the revenues of a highly unpopular tax. Ironically, as his battles with Parliament plunged England into civil war, his navy sided with Parliament, and in 1649, Charles was executed for treason. During the new Commonwealth period under Oliver Cromwell, England's need for renewed strength and security against royalists as well as hostile neighbors led to an even more powerful fleet. There's no doubt that as we enter the 17th century and we get towards the mid-period of that, towards what we call the Commonwealth period in the United Kingdom, the possibilities of increased firepower and improved technology dawn on people. And we start seeing the ability to concentrate firepower in line of battle tactics. And that is typified by the sort of battles that we saw between the Dutch and the English between uh, the 1650s and the 1660s. During the early part of the 17th century, the Dutch were a major commercial force along the coastal regions of England. Adept at shipbuilding, the British saw them as a threat to their trade as well as their coastline and sought a way to reduce their presence. In 1651, England decreed that the Dutch should be limited in their access to English trade by a piece of legislation known as the Navigation Act. The object of the Navigation Act is to increase the number of English seafarers so that the Navy will always have a good supply of sailors in time of war. It's also a way of attacking the economic success of the Dutch, Britain's main competitors at sea. And before the Navigation Act, the Dutch are carrying British goods from British ports to other British ports. This act cuts them out, it says, you can't do this. We are going to carry our own goods and we're going to do it by law. And as a result, there'll be more English sailors and more English ships. It's a critical attack on the economy of the Dutch Republic. The Dutch didn't take the British declaration lightly. In 1652, the British Navy became locked in battle in what would be the first of three conflicts against the Dutch. However, the fighting that was to come would be vastly different from their previous clashes with the Spanish. For one, the British began to construct ships that were aimed at overpowering their enemy. You start seeing the changes to building much more heavily built ships during the Dutch wars in the 17th century. You needed to build these ships very heavily and it's primarily to do with our concept of how we operated our fleets. If you look at this hull, it's 300,000 cubic feet of timber in its construction. You need to have, between you and the enemy, a good barrier, a wall, to defend yourself behind. Known as England's wooden walls, these mighty ships were initially constructed in the dockyard of Chatham. Chatham, a very exciting place. It's the birthplace of many of the ships in the Royal Navy. The Unicorn and the Victory, for example, are still in existence today. Some of the oldest ships afloat, and they started their life in Chatham. 
Founded in 1567, Chatham would eventually become the largest dockyard due to its location on the River Medway and its proximity to the Dutch. Its dockyards, its arsenals, its vast uh, victualling stores uh, were specifically designed to combat the threat from the Dutch. And I think we can easily underestimate the threat from the Dutch in the 17th century. They were the leading trading power uh, in Europe and they looked set to uh, become dominant uh, on the seas. Much to Oliver Cromwell's credit, he sought the help of experienced leaders such as generals of the sea Robert Blake and George Monk. Blake and Monk brilliantly brought to fruition a new strategy that would change the way naval battles were to be fought for centuries to come. Their ideas were codified in 1653 in a manual entitled The Fighting Instructions. Simply put, the fighting instructions directed that a fleet fight its engagements in a linear formation so the British ships would face their enemies broadside to broadside. The fighting instructions are developed to provide ground rules as to how the fleet should be conducted to ensure that every captain understands what his job is. They're not the top end of the spectrum, they're the bottom end. That's the lowest level of competence you expect of your fleet, the ability to form and maintain a linear formation to engage the enemy with cannon. From this point forward, English ships meant to fight in a fleet's main battle line were dubbed ships of the line. Fleets designed to fight entirely using cannon, a linear battle fleet, broadside to broadside, and the more cannon you have, the stronger your ship will be. So the English invent, first of all, the gun-armed ship of the line, and the first of those typically for them is called the Sovereign of the Seas, to tell the rest of the world who's in charge. Designed by a brilliant English shipwright named Phineas Pett, the Sovereign of the Seas was launched in 1637 well before linear tactics were codified in the fighting instructions. But her immense size and striking power made her the prototype for ships of the line for over 150 years. She was 232 feet long and weighed over 1,500 tons, making her by far the largest warship in the world. But her most impressive feature was her armament, 104 bronze cannon on three decks. Since ships of the line were not built to a standard set of specifications, the vessels were categorized by size and number of cannon. The largest ships of the line were termed first raters. A typical first rate would take between three and five years to build. They'd be built fairly slowly because they were intended to last for a long time. So the very structure of the ship had to be built steadily and allowed to mature as it was being constructed. And this would in involve three or four thousand tons of prime timber and the work of probably a thousand men at various stages putting the thing together. So it's an enormous undertaking. The Royal Navy was fully prepared to put their ships of the line to the test in the first battle of the Anglo-Dutch wars between Blake and Dutch Admiral Martin Tromp. And in May of 1652, the British fleet sailed to meet the Dutch ships head on, poised to hurl cannon fire at the enemy's hulls. And before the first blast from the first shot rang out, Blake knew the outcome of the battle and the war would forever change the face of England's Navy. Surrounded by the sea, with ongoing threats from the Dutch, French, and Spanish, England found herself forever defending her coast. But the primary region that needed to remain secure was along the English Channel. If an enemy could control this crucial waterway, its chances of winning any war with England were greatly increased. There's no doubt that um, from the Roman Empire onwards, the, um, the continent of Europe was very much in the minds of the people who lived certainly on the south and east coasts of uh, Britain, as it then was. And there grew up this assumption that the channel between Britain and Europe was something that was British. It's called today the English Channel. And you've got an amazing sort of continuity right through from almost Norman times that any ship that goes through there goes through courtesy of the Brits. The Dutch, more than any other country, were familiar with the English Channel and with the importance of seizing its control. But the English were equally experienced, and in 1652, Admiral Robert Blake sailed into the Channel to stop them. His opponent was the equally adept Dutch Admiral Martin Tromp. Blake, of course, came to military service in the middle of his life after being a merchant and an MP. 
And after military service in the English Civil War, he then becomes a general at sea. And he takes to the sea his understanding of warfare and his understanding of the use of artillery. And he's the first modern admiral, the first admiral to use the ship as a gunnery platform, pure and simple, and to build a tactical system around firepower. His opponent in the first Dutch wars, Tromp, is an admiral of the old school of dynamic tactics, of close action and boarding. On May 19, 1652, just off the White Cliffs of Dover, Tromp ordered his captains to refrain from lowering their flags in salute to a squadron of English ships, as they were required to do under the Navigation Act. Blake fired a warning shot across Tromp's bow. Tromp's return fire ignited the first battle of the war and the initiation of the heavily armed wooden walls in battle. Blake's ships of the line and new tactics took Tromp completely by surprise as artillery ripped into the Dutch ships. After losing two vessels and sensing the balance of power favored the British, the Dutch were forced to withdraw. Afterwards, Tromp and the Dutch Admiralty were forced to completely rethink their strategy. The Dutch ships are still attempting or thinking in terms of fighting in a kind of disorganized melee. And the Dutch admirals go home and say to their leaders that we've got to adopt this formation fast. And we too have got to start building bigger, more powerful ships with heavy gun armament. And we too have got to fight in the line of battle. Otherwise, we simply aren't going to be able to survive. In November of that same year, Tromp led 80 ships into battle against Blake's 40 ships of the line off Dungeness. Tromp's fleet battered Blake's, evening the score for the Dutch and more significantly, placing the channel in Dutch hands. However, their victory would be short-lived. No longer taking the Dutch Navy for granted, the English ships of the line redoubled their efforts, not only to regain control of the channel, but to institute a strangling naval blockade of the Dutch coastline. Trump was unwilling to surrender, believing he could still successfully engage the British in a Dutch-style melee. But on July 31, 1653, Trump's tactics and fate were decided at the Battle of the Texel. Leading 100 ships in an attempt to break the British blockade, Trump not only lost a decisive battle, he was killed in the onslaught. The Dutch fleet was shattered and their government was forced to sign the Treaty of Westminster in April of 1654. The Dutch were required to repay the English for their losses and salute England's flag in British seas. The first Anglo-Dutch war was over. Ultimately, under Blake's overall leadership, the ships of the line and their new tactics simply overwhelmed the Dutch. Admiral Blake ended up being our most aggressive, intuitive admiral, probably until the time of Nelson. Today, he's probably uh, slightly neglected, but after Nelson, probably our uh, most famous and uh, deservingly famous admiral. But the peace didn't last long. In 1658, Oliver Cromwell died. With no comparable leader to take his place, the Commonwealth collapsed and the monarchy was reestablished. In 1660, the period known as the Restoration began with the reign of Charles II. The Dutch continued to challenge England's supremacy in the trade lanes, while England conducted raids on Dutch colonies in North America and Africa. Finally, in March of 1665, a second war was officially declared. This time, however, the Dutch were better prepared. Without the leadership of Martin Trump, the Dutch Admiralty turned to Mikael de Reuter, who was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Dutch fleets. In all three of the Dutch wars, the best Admiral was a Dutchman. In all three of the wars, the most dynamic tactical moves are made by the Dutch. The English are relying on bigger and heavier ships with more powerful guns, and those famous fighting instructions for a line of battle to beat off the aggressive Dutch. And in most battles, they manage this. In some, they do it very well. However, de Reuter proved to be too strong an adversary. In the Northern English Channel in June of 1666, in what would be known as the Four Days Battle, de Reuter led 85 ships alongside George Monk 60 in a classic line of battle. The Dutch fleet was overpowering. De Reuter's triumph in this crucial contest gave the Dutch a momentum they would not soon relinquish. The final devastating blow to the Royal Navy would come in June of 1667. With the English ships docked in Chatham for a much needed refit, the Admiralty felt the area was safe from attack. 
However, as the British were planning their next move, de Reuter was already moving his ships up the River Medway to assault the unsuspecting British fleet and regain the advantage for his nation's navy at a single stroke. The River Medway, an anchorage in the Thames estuary near Chatham, seemed like a natural defense against invaders. The British believed the narrow channels of the river were too dangerous for an enemy to navigate in a surprise attack. In June of 1667, Dutch Admiral Mikhail de Reuter was determined to prove them wrong. With the help of a turncoat English pilot, de Reuter led his forces up the River Medway. In a desperate attempt to stop the Dutch assault, the British sank several of their own ships to block the channel. It was a futile effort. The Dutch reached the undefended English ships and wreaked havoc among them. It was one of England's darkest hours and one of the brightest for de Reuter. De Reuter, of course, is uh, the Dutchman every Englishman loves to hate because of his exploits uh, in the Medway during Charles II's reign. Um, another man committed to the fight uh, on behalf of his country. De Reuter's fleet had captured or destroyed eight British vessels, including the pride of their fleet, the massive Royal Charles. Badly beaten, it was England's turn to sue for peace, signing the Treaty of Breda in July of 1667. It was an inauspicious beginning for Charles II's monarchy and a stain on the reputation of the Royal Navy. It also made glaringly apparent that the Navy was badly in need of reform. Oddly enough, the man responsible for this endeavor would be a landlubber, a famous diarist, Samuel Pepys. He was passionately interested in the Royal Navy, and at a time of decline and underinvestment, Pepys sustained the idea of a navy organized on modern lines. And it is that spark to change things at that time being that then developed into the restoration period under King Charles II and the expansion of the navy with such people like Pepys behind it, who spent a lot of time reorganizing and laid down basically the pattern of the Navy we have today. Samuel Pepys was born on February 23, 1633 in London, to parents who were simple country folk with no distinct lineage. But by 1660, with hard work and the help of a rich and well-connected relative, he'd secured a position on the Navy board under Charles II. In that same year, Pepys began to write an extensive diary. It was a diary he would secretly keep for 10 years, and it would become the most thorough record of the era. With little knowledge of the sea and ships, Pepys' determination and inquisitive mind brought him to the realization that the system by which the Navy was run was completely corrupt. He discovered thievery and deceit in the logbooks and among shipbuilders. He began his quest for turning the Royal Navy into a professional organization by setting a standard for purchasing and dispersing food. He lays down basic accountancy rules for the purses of ships. He tries to stop fraudulent behavior by contractors. He establishes the sort of rations that sailors should have. He realized very early the importance that sailors attach to their diet. Pepys' reforms came at a crucial time in England's history. In the late 1660s, the Dutch became the leading economic country in Europe and were wary about other nations challenging their position. And no one was more anxious for war against the Dutch than King Louis XIV of France, who had now built his kingdom into a formidable power. The power that everybody is frightened of, everybody admires, nobody can possibly ignore. And Louis XIV's France builds from scratch, the biggest navy in the world. From almost nothing, in just over 20 years, they built the biggest navy in the world. Although the British had previously signed an alliance with the Dutch in 1670, the French king was able to secretly convince Charles II to join forces in an anti-Dutch coalition. It was a decision that would prove to be a serious mistake. In 1672, England and France declared war on the Dutch. The Royal Navy would go to battle yet again in a third Anglo-Dutch war. However, the British found themselves pawns in a deadly deceit by the French. As 65 British ships and 36 French ships were anchored off Solvay, the Royal Navy's old enemy, Mikhail de Reuter, sailed quickly into the perimeter and took the Allies by surprise. 
The battle raged for 14 hours. Both sides suffered heavy losses, but the results were inconclusive. Most importantly, in the Battle of Seoul Bay and the two engagements that followed, the Royal Navy failed to receive adequate support from the French. Both parties uh, have reason to be uh, extremely alarmed at what the French are doing. The Dutch, because France was, Louis XIV was a declared enemy of theirs and in fact tried to invade and conquer them. The English, because Louis XIV is, well, an ally in fact, but also a rather obvious rival. It was becoming clear that King Louis XIV had maneuvered the two strongest navies into fighting each other. However, his hopes of reducing their forces to clear the waters for the French ended when the British and the Dutch reached a peaceful agreement in 1674. Though the Dutch continued their fight with the French, the British were fortunate to bow out, but not before their fleets were, once again, depleted. The three Anglo-Dutch wars of the 17th century demonstrate that England is capable of raising and deploying the most powerful battle fleet in Europe. They also demonstrate that, certainly in the Second and Third Wars, it can't afford to do this for more than two years at a time. And the English are bankrupt at the end of both the Second and the Third Anglo-Dutch Wars, and their ability to fight at sea is seriously degraded by this. Meanwhile, Samuel Pepys continued pursuing his goal of unifying the Navy into a disciplined fighting force. One significant change was terminating the practice of buying positions in the Navy. Officers were now required to earn their ranks. Further, in 1677, Pepys established examinations for lieutenants, especially in their knowledge of mathematics and navigation. And this is the first time that well-born officers, as well as those who have been brought up in the sea tradition, have been tested as equals. And it sets a minimum standard which uh, makes sure that the people at sea, as officers, are professionals before they move up the promotion ladder. Pepys' reforms had begun to take hold, and for the first time, the Royal Navy became a thoroughly professional organization. Pepys is the first recognized civil servant of the modern style. He checks up in detail on the officers who appointed to supervise the fleet and its supply train. He organizes ships to go out and victual uh, the warships at sea. This is the first time this is done on a systematic scale. And he lays down the rules and regulations for professional conduct at sea. Pepys has one of those critical background roles. He doesn't win any battles, but he puts the equipment in place and the programs underway to build that fleet that wins the battles. Pepys is the administrative powerhouse of the Stuart Navy. He's the man that makes everything happen. Pepys' reforms laid the foundation for a tradition of naval excellence that still exists to this day. His brilliant mind and the historical period he chronicled are preserved as national treasures in the Samuel Pepys Library at Magdalen College, Cambridge home to his celebrated diary and volumes of books dedicated to the time when both a nation and its navy underwent radical reform. Maybe the major oddity of the library consists of the diaries. They are the one set of personal documents. They were carefully preserved in the library from the moment when he began to establish it. For the next 150 years, Pepys' reforms and the wooden walls were repeatedly put to the test, most notably against their constant adversary, the French. As the British continued adhering to the fighting instructions, the French were carefully planning the means to break through England's wooden walls. In 1781, as blood from the American Revolutionary War continued to spill, English Rear Admiral Thomas Graves met French Admiral Francois de Grasse off the coast of Virginia. Graves signaled his ships to fall into a line of battle. What happened next forced the Royal Navy to rethink their entire strategy of engagement. In the late 17th century, as the French built up their fleet with the express purpose of outmatching England, the Royal Navy was taking its own steps to exploit every edge in battle. And one way was by educating the Navy in the science of navigation. It was a program that began with Charles II and Samuel Pepys. From the time that Charles II establishes the Royal Observatory, the critical role is navigation at sea for the Navy and for the other great arm of British strength, the Merchant Marine. The ability to trade with the rest of the world over seas commanded by the Royal Navy is critical. But you can't use those seas as a highway until you can navigate them safely. 
and throughout the 17th and 18th centuries the steady development of navigational science in Britain is all about the practical exploitation of the sea. And Pepys himself was important here uh, because he was the first person to insist on examinations for the Navy and those examinations were all to do with navigation. The difficulty was longitude. It was determined that by utilizing a clock on board ship calibrated to the known time at the longitude in England and with regular observations of the sun, sailors could pinpoint their longitude anywhere in the world. There was only one problem. The pendulum clocks of the day were not reliable enough to keep accurate time through the variable conditions at sea. A self-taught clockmaker with a genius for mechanical devices decided to solve the problem. His name was John Harrison. Well, Harrison, of course, spent 26 years of his life uh, pursuing this question of, of a stable time reference because he'd recognized that it was the key to the understanding of longitude. Harrison painstakingly designed and constructed three innovative timepieces, H1, H2, and H3. Each had problems, however, not the least of which were their relatively large size and extreme complexity. Then, in 1759, he built a revolutionary timepiece called the H4. It could be held in the palm of the hand, yet was accurate to within two and a half seconds per month. These four clocks, which were successively smaller, more easy to transport, uh, each very sophisticated in its own way, and they're stunning to look at, each produced with virtually no equipment or tools that we'd recognize today for precision work of that nature. And they are a marvel. Harrison's invention, later dubbed a chronometer, gave the Royal Navy a tremendous edge against the French. It was an edge that was needed time and time again as the British found themselves fighting their old enemies for the better part of a century. In a battle that would prove the weaknesses in the fighting instructions, the French, led by Admiral Francois de Grasse, deployed ships to aid the Americans in the Revolutionary War. These vessels were the culmination of French Secretary of State Jean-Baptiste Colbert's naval reforms to build faster and more maneuverable vessels than the British. In August of 1781, de Grasse was met by English Rear Admiral Thomas Graves off Chesapeake Bay near Yorktown, Virginia, where General George Washington and America's French allies under General Rochambeau were besieging a British army under Lord Cornwallis. As Graves spent valuable time forming the line as set forth by the fighting instructions, de Grasse attacked, firing high to disable the English ship's sails and rigging. With wooden warships, the greatest danger on board the ship is that the enemy's shot punches through the hull of the ship and drives huge oak splinters across the gun deck. And these will cut down the gun crew and do tremendous damage. The French system was generally to fire up into the rigging to try and disable the enemy so they could escape and carry out their mission. The British system was to fire into the enemy's hull and to kill the enemy's crew so the ship would be taken. De Grasse then used the superior speed of his ships to lead Graves on a six-day hit-and-run chase in the Atlantic. Though only one English ship of the line was sunk during the engagement, the British fleet was drawn away from Yorktown. With no naval support, Cornwallis was overwhelmed by the French and American armies. De Grasse's strategy had allowed General Washington to win the decisive battle of the Revolutionary War. The linear tactics that had served the Royal Navy so well since the Anglo-Dutch Wars were demonstrating their limitations. Then in 1782, a Scottish landlubber named John Clark penned an essay on naval tactics. In it, he examined the weaknesses of linear tactics and proposed new radical methods of attacking the enemy at sea. Rather than simply lining up in the traditional fashion, the ships would maneuver to charge the enemy at its weakest point. In many ways, the work of Clark of Eldon provides a reflection on the tactical system from the side. It's not a naval officer saying, we can do better than this. It's an Edinburgh man sitting on the shore thinking, I'm sure they can do better than this, and here's some ideas. It's a work that inspires thought. One British admiral inspired by Clark was George Bridges Rodney. In April of 1782, Rodney's fleet of 35 happened upon French Admiral Francois de Grasse's 33 ships, escorting a convoy in the West Indies. 
Once again, de Grasse led the British on a chase. However, after four days, Rodney cornered de Grasse against a group of islets called the Saints, pressing the French admiral into battle. Rodney wasted no time implementing Clark's theories. He captured five ships, a stunning accomplishment for the time. Admiral de Grasse became his prisoner as well. The Navy's problems in the Revolutionary War stem essentially from faulty strategy. Uh, instead of taking control of European waters and pinning the French down, they pursued the French around the world, they pursued various strategic options, and it was only really in 1782 when they achieved a superior concentration of force at a decisive point in the West Indies that they finally brought the French to battle and defeated them. Yet despite its victory at the Seines, there were still problems in the Royal Navy. In 1797, the British were fending off French fleets in the shadow of the French Revolution. But furious because their pay had been raised in over a century and now stood at less than half that of merchant seamen, British sailors in the ships anchored at both Portsmouth and the East Coast defied orders from their captains and refused to set sail to face the French fleet. The fleet would have gone to sea if the French had come out, but the men in the fleet knew very well that the French not only weren't coming, but couldn't. The French fleet at that moment was unmanned and not prepared for sea. So they knew they had a window of opportunity to conduct what was a straightforward economic trade dispute. After over a month of tense negotiations, the British government granted its seamen a 23% pay increase and a royal pardon for their actions. But despite the problems the Royal Navy encountered, it was during this era of almost constant battle engagements that a foundation of experience was laid that would prepare it for one of the greatest periods in its history. It's the teething ground of which prepare the Navy for the final battles for the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. And this is how we became to have this professional group that was able to withstand anything that was thrown at it during the period 1793 to 1815. It was also a period in which England was in desperate need of commanders who could lead the Royal Navy to victories that would, once and for all, end any thought of going up against her wooden walls. As Napoleon Bonaparte sought European domination, the daring young British admiral would challenge his Navy's traditional battle plans, and in so doing, fight its greatest battle and become his nation's greatest hero. On May 7, 1765, a magnificent new ship of the line was launched at the Chatham Dockyards. Her name was HMS Victory. It was a name that would prove to be prophetic, not just for battle, but for an entire nation. The Victory is an example of the mid to late 18th century first-class fighting ship, the, the first-rate three-decked line of battleship. The Victory tells you that the Royal Navy is a battle fleet, not a fleet designed for other kinds of warfare. It's designed to fight full-scale battles against the best the enemy can offer. And the Victory, both by her name and by her design, is the flagship of a great fleet to fight the enemy to secure command of the sea. But a ship's true strength could only be realized by its commander and crew. Fortunately for the victory and for King George III, during their most crucial times, Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson was in command. Born in 1758, Nelson began his naval career at the age of 12 as an apprentice. Remarkably, before the age of 21, he was given command of a frigate. But Nelson's life at sea was not always smooth. In 1794, during the Siege of Calvi, he was wounded and lost sight in his right eye. In 1797, in an attack on Santa Cruz de Tenerife, he lost his right arm when it was shattered by a musket ball. But Nelson's bravery and aspirations never wavered, and he quickly rose to the rank of Vice Admiral. A respected commander, Nelson had the good fortune of serving in the Royal Navy following a century of reform. A lot of development had been going on, a lot of people had been trying out new ideas. Nelson was the heir of generations of intelligent admirals who had attacked some of the tactical problems of handling ships of the line and had developed various solutions. The striking thing about him is that he was strikingly flexible and eclectic and he took further than any British Admiral had done before him a style of command which involved delegation and trusting his subordinates. 
A lot of admirals found it very difficult to delegate. Uh, some indeed found it psychologically quite impossible. He's probably the most situationally aware admiral that we have had in our history. He was a great reader of scenes and then how to exploit those to his advantage. He then let loose basically what was a navy that knew what it was doing in detail. Nelson's intelligence, bravery and leadership served him extraordinarily well throughout his career. And never was this more apparent than during the Napoleonic War at the Battle of Trafalgar. At the time, Napoleon Bonaparte was leading France and their ally Spain in a war against England. If the Franco-Spanish fleet could defeat the Royal Navy, it would clear the way for Napoleon to unleash an invasion of Britain. On the morning of October 21st, 1805, off the Cape of Trafalgar on the Spanish coast, the importance of the moment was very much on Admiral Nelson's mind as he prepared his fleet of 27 ships of the line to attack the Franco-Spanish fleet of 33. Nelson ordered signal flags raised that read, England expects that every man will do his duty. When it went to the top of the masts, his second in command, Cuthbert Collingwood, said, why is Nelson sending us this signal? We know our duty. But Collingwood understood when all the fleet started to cheer that Nelson had tapped into that great vein of emotion which cooler men like Collingwood never could reach. Nelson's battle plan was simple yet brilliant. Drawing on the ideas of John Clark and the experiences of Admiral Rodney, he would split his fleet into two columns. He would then order them to steer head on into the French and Spanish line, cutting the enemy into three segments. Due to the direction of the wind, the first segment would only be able to continue north, essentially leaving the battle to be fought by the rest of the line, which would now be badly outnumbered by the British. As the British column slowly moved toward the Franco-Spanish line at a speed of barely three knots, each commander had time to ponder his role in the upcoming battle. At the Battle of Trafalgar, a very in interesting incident occurs. As the British uh, fleet is approaching the French and Spanish fleet, the captain of the French ship, Red Utabla, can see which his opposite number is going to be. He can see it's going to be the victory. And he sees that victory vastly outguns him. So being a man of initiative, he thinks, well, how best can I avoid that opening cannonade? So he takes a lot of his sailors out of the hull, away from the guns, puts them in the rigging and forms them up as boarding parties on his upper deck. Once the battle is joined, the Redoubtable is raked by devastating cannon fire from the victory. The French boarding parties are unable to assault Nelson's ship. But in the rigging, the French sharpshooters are able to sweep victory's decks as he stands in full view and commands the battle. One of their musket balls strikes Nelson. The British ships of the line fire broadside after broadside, pounding away at the remaining ships that Nelson had so brilliantly cut away from the rest of their fleet. In the end, 19 of the enemy's 33 ships of the line were either destroyed or captured. Trafalgar is a spectacular, devastating melee. Trafalgar is the last major sea battle of the Napoleonic Wars. It's the last time the French dare to send a full-size fleet out to sea. It's the last time they have the ambition to try and change the balance of power at sea. And the fact that that fleet is annihilated by the British means that their chances of winning the war against Britain through invasion have finally come to an end. Sadly, Trafalgar was not without tragedy for the English. Nelson died a few hours after being told of his smashing triumph. As word of his death spread through the fleet, shock and sorrow were overwhelming. Nelson's body was carried home on his battered ship Victory for a state funeral the likes of which England had never seen before or since. Huge numbers of people weeping in the streets for somebody they never met. Uh, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, it will be extraordinary even today when we have mass means of communication which give us the illusion of knowing people who we have never met personally. Uh, but none of those existed in the 18th century, and yet the sort of magnetism of Nelson's personality reached out and touched people of all classes in an extraordinary way. The Battle of Trafalgar made Horatio Nelson the most celebrated admiral in the long history of the Royal Navy. His genius as a leader transcends time to reach deep into the hearts of naval officers. I think being a modern uh, naval officer, you, you bear a, a terrific burden. You have all these famous people looking over your shoulder, making sure you're doing the right thing. 
and certainly the modern naval officer still has the spirit of Nelson in his mind, the spirit of aggression, the spirit of getting at the enemy. Nelson is two things. Nelson is the greatest naval leader of all and his tactics at Trafalgar and at all his other battles show a, an elegant simplicity and a, a command of the full range of naval warfare which no other commander I think in history has ever matched. But also he's the first and quite the most spectacular national hero. He is the man that holds the country together in its darkest hour when invasion is threatened, when the enemy seem to be winning all the other battles everywhere else. Nelson is the talisman of victory. So even after he's dead, he has to be brought back and put into the national pantheon. And he remains as a godlike figure for the next century to justify Britain's view of itself in the world. The spirit of Nelson isn't all that survives from this great period in naval history. Today, HMS Victory is carefully preserved and maintained in Portsmouth, England. Rich in history and breathtaking in stature, she is a monument to a pivotal era for the Royal Navy. Like the many officers and ships that came before them, Nelson and Victory do not merely represent revered memories of glories past. They continue to live and breathe as national treasures in the storied traditions that created the legends of the Royal Navy's great wooden walls. Blake's cunning skill against the Dutch and Nelson's victory at Trafalgar prove that it's not only large ships and numbers and size of weapons that win battles, but the strategy and courage behind them. The tragedy of Trafalgar was the death of Nelson himself. This is where he was standing, and this is the musket ball that killed him. As shipbuilders began to look to new materials and new technology, the glorious days of the wooden walls would soon fade over the horizon, and the awesome, resilient ships of steel, steam, and unimaginable firepower would forever change the course of the Royal Navy and war at sea. <laughs>